then there is a paradox that exists. Um, algorithmic decision making, automated decision making, if you will, is presented as an effort to eliminate human bias. And it's presented as being a solution to human bias. But in reality, what is observed is that automated decision making can actually not just replicate human bias, but can actually amplify it. So imagine that you have one biased human manager, right, who's in charge of applications. That human manager might impact or influence the results of like 100 applications. But a biased algorithm used basically centrally by one corporation could actually impact the results of thousands, if not millions, of applications. So in this way, automated decision making, even though it's supposed to be a cure-all for bias, not only replicates bias no, and, 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 and amplifies it, but I'm actually arguing when you look at American law, it can actually obfuscate the evidence of bias. So it can actually make it harder to prove bias. So as we've seen you know, from the headlines, there is evidence of bias even when companies are trying to use algorithmic systems for decision making. So you heard about Amazon scrapping its you know, secret AI recruiting tool that it had built, but which then subsequently showed bias against women. Um, you heard about Facebook basically allowing employers to algorithmically uh, target um, certain groups, you know, men and also certain ethnic groups for job ads and ex while excluding others. Um, and you also heard, heard the same for age discrimination. Um, but what you might not have heard making the headlines is the actual human experience of applying for a job on uh, a hiring platform. So in a prior paper, a co-author and I actually did the experiment of trying to apply for a job on a hiring platform. And this was a job for a retail company. So think Walmart, Target, it could be one of those, I wouldn't say. But the, what we found was this. Um, when you came to the scheduling uh, section of the application, so there was a section that said, put in your availability. When are you available to work? So in my mind, you know, as a woman, I'm thinking, okay, why would they be asking you this before even the interview? So for me, I felt that this was sort of somewhat of a red flag. So I thought, let me actually try to constrain my availability um, and make my availability, availability basically similar to that of a woman who cannot afford childcare. So a woman that has a child and cannot afford childcare. Essentially, the profile of a woman who would be applying to that type of job, which is a low-wage retail job. So I put in my availability as 7 to 3 p.m., which is really roughly when the school, uh, you know, school period ends in the U.S. And what I found was that I could not go on to the next page. So as long as I had constrained my availability, I could not actually complete the application. Right. So what does this mean? It means that I'm already called out of the applic applicant pool before I even complete the application. OK, so that's one example. Another example was a man in Massachusetts who was attempting to complete an application online. And he came across a question asking for his graduation date from college. Um, the answer had to be entered by the use of a drop-down menu. And what he found was that the drop-down menu, um, only uh, the, the earliest the drop-down menu was 1990, right? So essentially excluding older applicants because he found that he could also not complete his application because there was literally no way for him to register his answer, which was earlier than 1990. So the point I'm making is both those attempted applications are actually not captured, right? So there's no data retention uh, mandate, meaning that my application mimicking uh, a woman with you know, childcare needs and his application you know, 
which was a, an older worker, could effectively be called without leaving a trace, without leaving a record. Okay, so these are the, some of the problems that I will address in this paper, and I will think through um, some ways to really um, address this problem of bias being both amplified and obfuscated by algorithmic hiring systems. So here is the organization of the paper. First, I sort of describe the algorithmic turn. Um, then I describe the capture of the algorithmic capture of hiring, um, which is really the case study that this paper is focused on. Um, and then I think through about why this is actually a legal problem and not a technical problem. And then finally, I propose some new legal frameworks within the American context um, for tackling this problem. So first, I make the argument that um, there is actually an algorithmic capture of hiring in the United States. And what I mean by that is that when you look at the uh, Fortune 500 companies, um, the top 20 all basically exclusively use online hiring. They make some exceptions because they have to, um, you know, pursuant to the American with Disabilities Act, and that if you can prove you have a disability, then they, you know you might be able to use a paper application. But generally, you must complete your application online in order to work for Walmart, Kroger, IBM, Home Depot, McDonald's. Um, you might also notice that these companies uh, also map onto the low-wage workforce, um, which are mostly made up of minority, you know, racial minorities um, and people with, um, uh, you know, less education. So these are not necessarily people with higher education. So in the U.S., that's considered a vulnerable workforce. Um, and the issue is that their entrance into the labor market is now captured by algorithmic systems. Um, and, you know, the question is, of course, what's new here, right? Because legally speaking, we know that bias in employment decisions already exists, right? We know that employment discrimination happens. We know that humans discriminate unlawfully sometimes. And the question is, why is this different? Why is algorithmic discrimination or algorithmic bias di different? Well, I am thankful to Professor Jack Balking for his uh, repost, um, which is basically that that's the wrong question to ask. It's not, you know, why is this different or why should we care? It's more about what does this reveal? What does this move to algorithmic hiring? What does it reveal about our values as a society? And what does it make more salient in terms of how hiring actually takes place? Okay, and then the next question is, but isn't automated decision making still better than human decision making? Like, why should we tie ourselves up in knots by the fact of these, you know, incidences of bias that we see? Um, well, my response to this is, it's a false binary, right? It's a false binary because you're, you're basically trying to disentangle automated decision making from human decision making, right? So in terms of saying whether automated decision making is better than human decision making, I don't concede this for three reasons. Well, the first is that an adjudication of whether hiring platforms are more or less biased than humans is actually not a, real, it's not a legal question. It's actually a social scientific one that would demand rigorous longitudinal research. And while there is some research claiming that, um, the relative novelty of hiring platforms um, makes those research question, a little bit questionable. And there's just not a wide variety of research in a wide variety of fields to actually conclusively say that. Um, second, um, I also do not believe that an actual adjudication of whether hiring platforms are less biased than humans is actually necessary. Um, it's not necessary because the point is we want to develop new legal frameworks specifically designed to govern automated decision-making and hiring. So 
Professor Julie Cohen uh, of Georgetown makes this argument clear in her article, Law for the Platform Economy. We have present laws that govern human, human behavior, uh, human decision making, and employment. So why shouldn't we also have frameworks or new laws that would adequately govern uh, algorithmic decision making? And my third and most important point here, um, to continue with this argument you know, for or against human decision making is really to create a false binary. As I have detailed and as I will continue to show, um, the human hand still remains present even with algorithmic decision making and employment and human bias can be introduced at any step of the process. First from the design of the platform itself and then at the output where the results of the platform has to be interpreted by humans. So what I'm aiming to do with this paper is really um, what I call exposing the mechanical Turk. So I'm sure you all, all are um, familiar with the Amazon Turk, but you may not actually be familiar with the history of where that ter term really comes from. So the mechanical Turk, also known as the chess Turk, was a chess playing machine constructed in the late 18th century. Although the mechanical Turk was presented as an automaton chess playing machine that was capable of beating the best human players, the secret of the machine was that it contained a human man concealed inside its chambers. The hidden chess master controlled the machine while the seemingly automated machine beat noble statesmen like Napoleon and Benjamin Franklin. Thus, the mechanical Turk relied on obscuring the role of the human chess master as part of its allure. I'm arguing that automated hiring systems are no different. They rely on obscuring the role of the human in creating the criteria on which the applicants will be judged and also in interpreting the results um, of the algorithmic process. So I want you to consider this story that I stumbled upon. Um, so one attorney was hired by a corporation which was seeking to adopt uh, a hiring, an automated hiring system, basically firm-wide. Now, this you know, firm had the good sense to say, OK, before we institute this firm-wide, let's hire an attorney to basically audit this hiring system for us. So the attorney, um, being trained uh, <laughs> you know, to ask the right questions, posed this question to uh, the platform developers. Can you please tell me, based on these resumes that we're inputting, what are the two most salient or the two most um, important variables for which a candidate is being picked out? Right? M meaning basically which variables have the highest correlation for a candidate being picked? Do you want to know what those variables were? Yes. Um, the candidates were named Jared and <laughs> not necessarily rock climbing. That was my analogy, but these candidates had also played high school lacrosse. So what do you take away from this? Who is named Jared? Are there many women that you know named Jared? I don't know any women named Jared. I'm sure they are. But the correlation is, these are male candidates, right? OK, who plays high school lacrosse? You might not know this in Canada, but in the US, who plays high school lacrosse? Well, exactly. And also white, right? It's, it's, it's a very racialized sport, and it's a very uh, high socioeconomic sport because of the equipment you have to buy to play lacrosse. And in fact, many high schools don't have high school lacrosse. Like you usually have to go to a high school in a very wealthy neighborhood to have high school access to high school lacrosse. So, but those were the two most salient factors. And of course, the question is, how is this related to job fitness? 
What could be happening here for those to be the most salient factors? Well, if you had read anything about Amazon and its debacle in terms of women being um, biased, you know, in, in terms of the hiring algorithm being biased against women, you might realize that what's happening here is actually the machine selecting the same types of people from the resumes that it has that has been fed into it. So what a lot of companies do in terms of training the hiring algorithms is they pick their 10 best performers, right? So existing people in their companies and they use those resumes to train the algorithm. So if you have a company that already has certain imbalances in either gender or race, what will happen? The algorithm will replicate those same imbalances while coding it as cultural fit. And I'll, get, I'll talk a little bit more about this. So in a previous paper, um, not this paper, but a previous uh, empirical paper in which my co-author and I um, analyzed, you know, we did a critical discourse analysis of 137 texts related to the development of hiring algorithms. What we found was the raison d'etre of these um, machines was that they were supposed to clone for cultural fit. The idea was that these machines were replicating your best people. They were basically trying to find the same types of people that you already had within your company. They were not trying to discover hidden talent or um, expose you to different types of people that you may never have considered. No, they were supposed to be shortcuts for you to find the same types of people that you already had and you already thought were great. Okay. So what's the problem with this, right? Employer discretion, right? What's wrong with cultural fit? Shouldn't employers have the discretion to determine who would best fit in for their workplaces? Well, the problem is that such discretion could rob some types of candidates from the equal opportunity to be even considered for employment, right? Imagine that a workplace is determined by the people in it. Now imagine that one group of people, however you want to define them, have predominated in a certain workplace, cultural fit would then necessarily raise a strong hurdle for job candidates from protected groups who have not historically been represented or who have historically been underrepresented in that workplace. So consider this case, for example, uh, in the United States. This is Nate V. Murray. So in this case, uh, this was a Native American which, who had been hired um, on a probationary basis in a school district. This woman was told at one point by the principal that she was geographically, racially, culturally, and socially out of place. And when she was subsequently fired by the superintendent who had never sat in on her class, the court found that there was no evidence of discrimination. It was just a matter of lack of cultural fit. But consider also the difficulties of discerning cultural fit. Empirical social science has actually shown that employers usually rely on gut feeling when evaluating cultural fit and they're often incorrect in the assessments. Also, it is incredibly difficult to discern cultural fit out of context. It is only really once a candidate starts working in any given organizational culture that the employee's cultural fitness or lack thereof becomes apparent. So the fact is these machines, these algorithmic systems are basically using cultural fit as uh, a hard and fast cr criteria by basically replicating what is already in the workplace and presenting this as sort of objective criteria rather than criteria that might be colored by race or gender. 
or other protected characteristics. But the issue is, or uh, even an even bigger issue is, that these hiring systems represent problems of proof for the plaintiff uh, who might be seeking to bring a, a case for employment discrimination. So under American law, you can bring a case under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act for employment discrimination on the basis of uh, discrimination on the basis of race, gender, other protected characteristics. Now, there are two ways you can do this under the law. There's disparate treatment, which basically requires that you present smoking gun evidence of basically intentional discrimination. So you basically have to show that memo saying, we're not going to hire this person because, you know, the person is a woman. We're not going to hire this person because the person is Native American. You have to show this type of evidence. As many of you can, I, I, I would say, agree, uh, employers are more sophisticated than that. They're not going to leave that kind of smoking gun evidence. Um, but then there's another method, which is the disparate impact theory of action. And this is basically the idea that while you might not have smoking gun evidence of intentional discrimination, you can show through statistical evidence, and the question is how much, that still remains an open question, and many courts differ, but you can show through sort of a preponderance of statistical evidence that one group, one protected group, has been disproportionately negatively impacted by a hiring practice that the uh, corporation or firm is using. Uh, I mean, that's not just the, that's just the first part, right? Because then there's a, there's a second part where the company can come back and say, sure, there is this proportionate impact, but we have a business reason for why we're doing it. And then the burden, the burden shifts back and forth. So in this paper, however, I am arguing that to actually address algorithmic bias or discrimination in automated hiring systems, we need to come at it from different vantages, right? So one vantage or one position is holding accountable the maker of the algorithmic hiring system. Because remember, the maker is designing the features, right? So the maker, for example, is the person that created the drop-down menu that ended at 1990. That's the maker of the algorithmic system, right? Another advantage is holding responsible or liable the employer, the employer who's using the system. Now, the employer could say, well, I didn't know that you know, the system I'm using only had graduation dates that ended at 1990, but that's not good enough, as you, you later see. I think they should know. They should audit the systems that they're using. It's their responsibility. Um, and then a third vantage would hold both parties jointly liable, so the maker and the employer. So from the first vantage, which is looking at the maker of the algorithmic system, all right, I'm arguing that there's actually a fiduciary duty to prevent bias. And this is in following with uh, the theory set forth by Jack Balking, um, who basically um, proposes that information fiduciaries, uh, that, that basically pl platforms become information fiduciaries because of their relationship uh, with the, the third party in which they obtain information, special information in the course of that relationship. So if you think of hiring platforms, they are obtaining information from the applicant and then relaying it to the employer. And some of that is special information, right? Um, work history, uh, other sensitive personal information. So in that way, you can see, or you could argue that the hiring platform then is a fiduciary. And under American law, a fiduciary owes a duty of care to use the information that's entrusted to it in a way that is only in the best interests 
of the trustee, meaning the, pers uh, the person that uh, has given it the information, right? So in that way, you could then argue that automated hiring systems owe a duty to prevent bias. Now, the fiduciary duty uh, theory has received some critiques. For one, uh, Jack Balkin uses the analogy of a doctor uh, and a patient, right? So Jack Balkin, in his theorizing of the way information fiduciaries work, is that they're the doctor. And us, as consumers, we're the patient. And we're entrusting our private, uh, sensitive information to them. And just like doctors have this doctor-patient um, you know, responsibility to keep information secure, information fiduciaries should have that same responsibility. Well, uh, Lena Kahn, Professors Lena Kahn and David Posen have expressed doubts that this theory actually adequately captures the type of relationship that platforms have with consumers. So, so they, 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 so basically, the argument is we doubt, you know, basically they doubt whether the concept of information fiduciaries is an adequate or apt response to the problems of information asymmetry and abuse that does happen on these platforms. So with those critiques in mind, my paper actually offers improvements to the fiduciary duty theory. So in my paper, I offer the theory of the church's B fronts and then also uh, excavate or illuminate the idea of platform authoritarianism. So in regards to the tertius B fronts, what I'm aiming to do with this, with this theory is basically to acknowledge the information asymmetry and then also highlight the one-sided relationship that is happening here. So the tertius B fronts um, as a concept is built from George Simmel's typology. So George Simmel, the sociologist, um, had this typology of brokers, right? Who are basically entities that connect two disparate parties. And this is in the context of business firms. And in his idea, there can be two types of brokers. You have the tertius uh, youngins, which is the third that joins. And this is a broker who is actually interested in joining two disparate parties and helping them connect because this broker has both interests, uh, has the interests of both parties in mind and actually is working for their best interests. But then you have a second type of broker, which is the tertius gardens, the third that enjoys. This broker facilitates uh, the joining of the two parties, but only to a certain extent. While it's joining the two parties, it is also keeping them separate because the broker enjoys the benefit of keeping those parties separate because then it can continue on in a coordinated role over time. Because if we were to truly join the two parties, then its um, necessity to be a broker would cease. So the tertius gardens actually also actively seeks to keep the two parties separate. I theorize with the tertius B fronts that information fiduciaries or platforms, if you will, actually represent a third type of broker. So the tertius B fronts is a two-faced third. So this is a broker that is actually working for the benefit of one party in the triad, but is presenting itself as working for both parties. And it does this by its information asymmetry and also power asymmetry. What do I mean by this? So for example, you need to consider this in the context of platform authoritarianism. When you go on a website to complete your application as a job applicant, you don't decide what information you share. The platform decides. 
You don't just say, well, I'm just going to give you my resume and that's all I want to do. No, the platform actually directs you to what specifically you input and how you input it. This is platform authoritarianism. Currently, there are not really many laws that regulate what information, at least in America, what information and how that information can be presented on a job applicant platform. The platform decides all. So in that case, there's an information asymmetry. The job platform or the hiring platform is not offering you all this information about the employer. On the contrary, the job platform or the hiring platform is taking all this information about the employee, packaging it in, a, the, in whatever way it seems fit, and then delivering that information to the employer for the benefit of the employer. So the hiring platform ultimately works for the employer, but it presents itself to the job applicant as a time-saving device, as a convenience device. So in that way, it is a tertius bifront. So realizing or understanding this relationship then means we then need to think about new legal frameworks that would better allow job applicants to be protected from discrimination and bias based on this one-sided uh, information asymmetry relationship. So then, one idea is discrimination per se. So previously, I, I told you that under American law, there's really two ways to, to prove employment discrimination. One way is disparate treatment and the other is disparate impact. But I also told you the difficulties present in doing either one, right? With disparate treatment, you basically have to find smoking gun evidence and usually they just don't exist. And then with disparate impact, you have to have this statistical evidence. And unfortunately, the statistical evidence is under the control of the employer. It's under the control of the defendant. And within the framework of American law, defendants, meaning employers, can hide behind intellectual property law or trade secret law to prevent scrutiny of the hiring platforms that they are using. So this makes it untenable for the plaintiff to actually um, access the statistical evidence required. So my solution then is discrimination per se as a new doctrine that addresses the practical difficulties for the plaintiff. So what does this mean? It means there would be a burden shifting from the plaintiff to the employer who actually has access to the statistical evidence. So for example, Instead of having to provide this preponderance of statistical evidence to show the disproportionate impact, a plaintiff could say, just based on one practice that I have encountered in, in trying to complete an application, I can say that this practice is um, uh, prone or likely to result in disproportionate impact on a certain protected group, and therefore, it is discrimination per se. Now, of course, that's not the end of it. The employer then would have the burden of providing statistical proof to show, well, actually, no, right? The employer then would have the burden of saying, yes, we have this practice, which seems to you like could be, it could be discriminatory, but here is the evidence showing that it's not. And they would provide this evidence because they would be mandated to conduct audits of the hiring platforms. So that's a different paper. I could not fit everything in this paper. <laughs> um, so, so the idea is that this discrimination per se doctrine would work hand in hand with an audit mandate for hiring platforms. So the sticky issue with discrimination per se, of course, is what types of conduct would qualify? And I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, <laughs> so 
now coming from a different vantage, right? So we went from the vantages of holding the maker of the platform responsible, holding the employer responsible, and now this solution, I, I believe, can actually do both. So this third solution acknowledges that job applicants, in this case, are actually consumers and therefore are entitled to consumer protections that exist under American law. So under American law, um, the Federal Credit Report applies to entities that are considered credit reporting agencies. What is a credit reporting agency? Well, it's the typical ones that you would think. Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, basically agencies that um, would uh, give you a credit score when you go to like buy a car, um, buy a house, and th that score would be used for an economic decision. So previously, the FCR the FCRA has been read to apply to those types of, of uh, entities. Those type of entities have been read to be CRAs. But when you read the FCRA, it's actually broader than that. The FCRA does not say that CRAs are only companies that produced credit reports. It actually says that they're companies that produce any kind of re report that is used for an economic decision. So I'll repeat that again. The FCRA says that CRAs, credit reporting entities, and which would then be covered under the FCRA, are any entities that produce any kind of report that would be used for an economic decision. What is happening when you apply on a platform like Munster or Career Builder? Right? Those entities are creating reports on the job applicant. And that report is used for the economic decision of either offering or denying employment. So therefore, the FCRA does apply to hiring platforms. And if the FCRA does apply to hiring platforms, then they must comply with the information provisions under the FCRA. So the FCRA says basically that whenever a report has been created on a consumer and used for an economic decision, the consumer is entitled to receive a copy of that report. So in this way, job applicants can actually receive the dossier of information that has been used either to offer or reject them from employment. And in that way, they may actually be able to find if protected characteristics has been included in the analysis for either them being offered a job or rejected. And that way, they could then hold the employer responsible. Um, they could also hold the CRA responsible in terms of correcting any false information that has been included in their report. Okay, finally, I want to hammer home this point. Automated decision making is fallible. Discussions of whether they are better than human decision making or not is really misguided. That is not what we should be talking about. Rather, we should be focused on exactly the ways that they are fallible, which is that they replicate discrimination and then also hide proof. And because of these phenomena, we need new targeted uh, legal frameworks that will actually protect consumers who are using hiring platforms. So with that, I thank you for your kind attention. And I very much look forward to your comments.